especially if you're in a nice bubble of people like you and share your faith and, and you're living your life as you want, all of a sudden this seems to have exploded on the scene and just turning everything upside down. But in reality, during the, the past 25 years, this was the long march through the culture and the institutions. Welcome to the Edify podcast, where our guests share practical wisdom on living our faith in public. I'm Mary Fiorito. Thank you for joining us today. Mary Rice Hassan is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where she directs the Person and Identity Project. Her work is focused on equipping parents, as well as faith-based institutions, encountering gender ideology, and promoting the truth about the human person. Mary, thanks so much for joining us. It's uh, such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. It's a delight to be here, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I, I want to go back to a meeting that you and I were at together six, seven years ago, and you were talking about some of the work you had undertaken um, with this sort of gender ideology and transitioning and gender fluid you know, conversations in schools and things like that, because I think we hit like a peak about six, seven years ago when it really started coming into the mainstream consciousness. But you had been tracking this long before that. And I, I remember you being challenged that you might be overreacting a little bit and it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, and uh, I was so struck by your ability to really see the future coming and to be able to warn that, no, this is a real problem. And it's going to be a worse problem if we don't do something about it now. So how how was it that you... This first got on your radar because I know you're, you know you you're also very involved in pro life issues and women in the church and you have a number of different uh, different areas of expertise. What was it about this particular topic that caught your attention and how were you able to see before most others that this was really going to capture the American educational and medical institutions? Yeah, it, well, it's interesting because I was actually doing a research project. I got a grant to do a deep dive on a global level to look at uh, the issue of coercion and new models of authority, how religion was being displaced. But I was focusing on contraception and abortion. And then I, I was aware of, because I tracked the, the uh, challenges to sexual morality and marriage and things like that, I was aware of the gender issue. So I threw that in there too. <laughs> and as I started digging deep into this, I was just shocked to find out how far advanced it was in terms of uh, just global perspectives and things that were already in the works that really hadn't bubbled up to the surface in the sense of, um, for example, the United Nations now is very openly promoting all of this. At the time, they were just talking about gender equality and everyone thought of gender as being a synonym for women. And so you're talking about male-female equality, but really they already... Back since the the mid 1990s, they had already been writing documents and laying the academic groundwork to corrupt this whole idea of the person. So it, it was frightening, frankly, to look at how far downstream we were. And this was like you know eight, seven, or eight years ago when I was doing this research to see the inroads that they had made already, and to see how unaware most of us were about how this was being pushed. And um, at the time, the Obama administration was in government mm -hmm. and they, you know, there was always a, um, a spin machine going on. There was one message that would come for public consumption, but then when you looked at what they were doing on the policy level, you could see they were, they were already embedding the seeds for this to really come to fruition, which it did. And by 2015, they were openly pushing the transgender agenda mm -hmm. because they had won the same-sex marriage thing. Everyone was trying to keep it sort of under wraps because, because those who were pushing this ideology didn't want the same-sex, quote, marriage issue to be derailed by people's appropriate consternation and what was going on with the transgender issue and their yeah. sense of, hey, wait a minute, this makes some sense. So there was a strategic delay, really. And once once that flipped, it was uh, full steam ahead. Yeah, I feel like we took our eye off the ball because we were so concerned about marriage redefinition, rightly so, and the long-term implications of that for religious freedom, as you mentioned, and for institutions and people. Um, and when we did, this kind of snuck in the side door, it seems to me. 
Yeah, and, and I think two things happened. One, I think for those of us who, who are Catholic or Christian or Orthodox Jewish, you know, I, I think there was a reluctance because of the bitterness of some of those battles, the, the Prop 8 uh, battle in California. People stopped talking about the question of whether sexual difference matters. Just as decades earlier, they didn't want to talk about contraception and whether sex has a deeper meaning than simply pleasure. But right. once you take those, those deeper issues that, that really go to the heart of understanding who we are as a person and the nature of sexuality and the nature of our identity, one, once you take those, those topics off the table in terms of public conversation, and we think there's just silence, well, what happens is it's not silence. The void is filled by opposing messages and, and propaganda. And I'll give you an example, Mary, of, of something that I was digging into recently. Back in 1996, there was a small fringy group of, of transgender activists who got together in Houston. And it was probably a dozen of them, mostly males who were identifying as women. And they wrote up something that they called the International Bill of Gender Rights. Hmm. And in that International Bill of Gender Rights, I mean, big title, right, for these, these dozen or so activists, it, they said some very important things. They said identity should be self-defined, that the individual has a human right to change their body, modify their body in order to express their identity. They need to be free in a society to express this identity however they want without discrimination. They need to be able to form sexual relationships and quote, build families and acquire children without restriction according to their, their gender identity, their self-defined identity. And so all of the elements of what we're seeing today were in that document, which of course fizzled, went nowhere. Mm -hmm. But fast forward to 2023, and now we have on a global basis, we have the UN promoting exactly those same tenets. And what happened between 1996 and 2023 is that the left and those who were pushing this ideology for a variety of reasons captured the institutions. Right? Academia was already being captured at that point. That's where a lot of these ideas festered. And hmm. so was media was and entertainment were tipping over. But between 1996 and 2023, businesses went over to, to the side of promoting this ideology uh, through a carrot and stick approach of, of some of the LGBT lobbies. You had governments sort of buying into this because they saw this was, uh, um, they could ride a wave to power, right? This was progressive. This was all about equality, et, et cetera. You had philanthropists who made it big in the tech industry who then were able to co-opt the tech industry, but then use that, that money to, uh, as, as philanthropy, to shape policies, to influence the direction, and then education. We lost K through 12 education, which has always been a struggle, but it has really truly been captured. Teacher schools of education for the past decade, more than the past decade, mm -hmm. have been totally bought into gender ideology. So that's really what happened. For, for those of us who, you know, the average person kind of sitting on the sidelines and looking at the culture around them, especially if you're in a nice bubble of people like you and share your faith and, and you're living your life as you want, all of a sudden this seems to have exploded on the scene and just turning everything upside down. But in reality, during the, the past 25 years, this was the long march through the culture and the institutions and, and they've captured them. And, and the critical thing there to realize, I think, is that if we're going to turn this around, it's going to take a significant amount. Of it's going to it's going to be a full generation before we can turn this back. And in the meantime, um, you know, you need to protect your children because parental rights have, have been completely eroded. Um, you know, first we, we saw it with abortion, right, where it states that um, mm -hmm. tried to minimize or even eliminate altogether parental knowledge. I'm not just talking about consent, knowledge of a minor child having abortion. Um, and now we're seeing the same thing with the transgender movement where kids may have a different name and different pronouns at school and the parents are not told. And if they do find out and object, the, the, it's the parents who are the problem. Not the teachers and the school yeah. administration that that lied and misled and you know um, 
otherwise undermine parental authority. I, I find that just absolutely terrifying. The entertainment industry uh, are given incentives, financial incentives by certain foundations. If you work in a positive gay character or trans character into the storyline, into the plot, um, they'll be underwritten and funded. And when you're a small startup um, or a show that doesn't have a whole lot of interest at first, you know, um, they get this kind of funding and it allows them advertising and it's said, but, but there has to be a positive portrayal of this gay character. And it, I just, it, so it seeped everywhere into the culture. You can't, you know, during the month of June, you can't go anywhere. You can't go to children's shoe store. You know, I went into Stride Right to get a little pair of shoes for my daughter and Stride Right has big, you know, pride flags up and no one's yeah. safe. So Mary, it. one of the things that, that you're highlighting really is a, str- a strategy that the other side has employed for now several decades right. where, you know, they knew what their goal was. They want to change people's attitudes and they want to get to children. They want to shape culture because they want to change. It's much easier to affect cultural change by by um, educating and informing and and winning over to your side the young minds than it is to change the mind of someone who's 45 or 50. And we we can see that just looking at public polling. There's been a general shift on these issues among all ages, but the radical change is in the youngest generation. And so this was a strategic effort. And one of the things that they did across industries, not just entertainment and Hollywood, was they decided we're going to set the benchmarks. We're going to tell everyone else what equality looks like and what what compassion looks like. And we're going to say, for example, to the the movie industry, we're going to, there's a group called Glad, and and they would measure how many uh, characters you have that are LGBTQ and whether they're positive portrayals or negative portrayals. And if you do it according to their desires, if you have more and these are positive portrayals, you get celebrated and you're going to get funding, right? But if you don't, you're going to get the big backlash and the condemnation and the the name calling. And so anyone who's who's in business of any sort, whether it's it's making entertainment or whether it's uh, selling shoes like Stride Right, or or anything in between, you're very conscious of what's going to bring you sales and what's going to disincentivize. And so that is part of the power that these LGBT lobbies um, wielded because they had the foresight 20 years ago to say, we are going to be the experts in discrimination. We're going to be the ones to tell the rest of society when you're doing it right and when you're doing it wrong. And if you do it right, we're going to applaud you and, and give you a sticker that says best place to work or, or you know, something like that, LGBTQ friendly. And if you do it wrong, we're going to censor you. We're going to hound you out of your job. We're going to try to disrupt your contracts, et cetera. And they have been very, very successful at that across mm-hmm. the board, yep. all yep. areas of business, entertainment, uh, culture. So it's it, it really is... Uh, it's food for thought about how that culture change happened and, and what ground we seeded. Before we get to the next question, I just wanted to ask you, wherever you're listening to this podcast, please take a moment and leave us a review. That would really help us out. And if you're not subscribed, go do that as well so that you don't miss out on any future conversations with us on the Edify podcast. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the side effects to hormone therapy are just staggering. And I know this is something that you have written about and you have a lot of expertise on. So um, I'm not sure that a lot of our listeners, even who would be pretty well-read people in terms of events of the day, would be aware of what the complication rates are for various trans surgeries. But also, can, can we start with the effects of the hormone therapies? Because I think that's a good place to start because that's normally how it begins, right? You don't go immediately to surgical um treatment for gender dysphoria, you start with some hormone-based therapies, but those hormones have tremendous side effects. Sure. I think one helpful way to, to think about this is to think of a train, right? It, it starts from a station and goes to a destination. This trans train will has various stops. You can get on at the puberty blockers level. You can get on at the cross-sex hormones level. You can get on at the surgery level. There are some people who who simply jump aboard and, and go for the surgery first. And those are obviously people who are a little bit older. But 
there's there's a trajectory and what should concern us most is what's happening to young children because we have a double whammy going on here. We have the schools and pediatricians offices and counselors promoting the idea that that you are who you say you are. You are who you feel you are. So you as a child have to figure out who you are. And then they introduce concepts like, um, how do you know who you are? It's who you feel yourself to be on the inside. Mm -hmm. That's so confusing for a little kid. But at the same time, they have the schools promoting this idea that anyone can be anything and they see it in the cartoons, they see it in the movies and they they hear it from the teachers. At the same time, Kids, kids can be struggling with different things. They can be on the autism spectrum. They can be a child who's, who's lost a beloved grandmother or, or, or sibling and is struggling with grief and, and just is depressed or a kid who feels like they don't fit in. In other words, normal vulnerabilities among children, all of a sudden they hear a script that says, you know what, if you're depressed, if you don't fit in, if you uh, have trouble making friends, it's because you need to transition. You are in the wrong body. The reason why you feel uncomfortable, especially as kids approach puberty, is because, quote, you're in the wrong body. So there, there's a, a mind game that precedes any child starting jumping onto the train, right? But But it's important to realize that there is a significant number of young kids who are who express some sort of either discomfort with their body or confusion about their identities they're sent to a gender clinic or a gender therapist or even just their pediatrician who yeah. will then refer them to go to a gender clinic and if they are on the cusp of puberty they haven't yet gone through puberty they will be put on what's called puberty blockers it's an implant or an injection that has been used for children with precocious puberty in other words a, a child with Something, something going wrong in their body. But you take a child with a healthy body, and you say, "Oh, you're, you're, you don't want to go through puberty because you, you're troubled by your body. You're experiencing this confusion. We're going to freeze it right here. We're going to give you puberty blockers." And they, they make promises to the parents and the kids. This buys you time, so you can think. But what it does is it freeze frames the kid in sort of an immature state of mind. It hinders that natural growth in executive functioning, decision making. So they're less equipped to sort out their feelings. And they're also told it's fully reversible. There are no long term consequences. And that's not true either. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of the long term consequences that either parents aren't told or, um, you know, they don't even contemplate along the way um, when they are told, you know, there may be some side effects, but they don't think it's that bad or what have you. Can you talk a little bit about those? Sure. One of the, one that's gotten a lot of attention in recent years is the fact that when you stop a child's natural puberty, again, a child who had a healthy body until you intervened and you stop their natural puberty, puberty is a whole body process. So you're stopping the natural mineralization of your bones. Hmm. And puberty is the unique time in human growth when your bones get their strength and they they get denser and they grow and and you can't just stop that without ramifications. And we don't know what the long-term ramifications are because we have not seen a generation that started on puberty blockers and when has gone all the way to adulthood. We don't know whether they're going to be breaking bones every week. We do know from, for example, gender clinics in Sweden that put some some kids on puberty blockers for a couple of years, and the kids were developing uh, osteopenia, you know, before pre precursor to osteoporosis at the age of 13, 14. you know. So, so we know there's it's detrimental to bones. We know too it hinders children emotionally and socially because again they're not maturing along with their peers. But I think. The two most troubling aspects are that almost all children who are put on puberty blockers go on to cross-sex hormones. So it's not buying you time, giving you space to decide. It's creating a pathway because during this time you're being reinforced that, oh, I must really be the opposite sex or whatever I'm calling myself. But when you're put on these these hormones and you go, and so you don't develop, you don't mature in terms of your reproductive organs, your genitalia, and then you go right to cross-sex hormones, that one-two 
sterilizes you. So we have a generation now of kids, some unknown number, because here in the US, we do not keep good records, who started puberty blockers, never went through their natural puberty, and then were put on cross-sex hormones because they're getting antsy, everyone else is maturing, and they say, oh, we'll just put you on the cross-sex hormones, who are sterile. And, and when you think about that, Mary, there's no 13 or 14 or 15 year old, the, the point at which these kids are sterilized, who adequately understands what that means. That for the sake of, of um, feeling more comfortable with their body or not having to, to deal with the emotional things they have to sort through as they go through puberty, they have just lost the capacity forever to have their own genetic children. Right. Yeah, and, and to breastfeed if you're female, um, and it and it causes uh, not only the development, but as I understand it, premature aging of the brain, um, which I you know again, early onset Alzheimer's. You know, you wonder you wonder what this is going to look like in twenty or thirty years. Yeah. So the the real um, significant and irreversible health consequences. Really, besides sterility, that's a huge one, you know, comes in, that comes with the one-two punch, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones. Someone who just starts cross-sex hormones after they've already gone through their puberty, um, or even those who've done the puberty blockers, they are in for a rough ride. Because what happens is those cross-sex hormones are given to them at high doses, not normal. Everyone's got some of the opposite sex hormones, but these, these very high doses, and they cause uh, changes within a matter of months, some of which are irreversible. So girls lose their, their hair. If baldness runs in your family, you, you may start thinning and, and losing your hair at the age of 16. They get bad acne. They get their, their um, vaginal canal atrophies. And that's one of the things that uh, there was a, a whistleblower who came out in February who worked for the Washington University's uh, gender clinic. Right. Jamie Reed. Yes. Yes. And so she was talking about some of the damage done to these young teenage girls who were on these cross-sex hormones and the lining of their vagina, the, the uterine lining thins as well. And they have bleeding, they have lacerations, they have all these things. So, so it, the way to think about it is these cross-sex hormones can't give you the functioning of the opposite sex. All they can do is destroy your natural function. And, and that's what it does, along with cardiovascular problems. Uh, obesity is a, a, an increasingly recognized problem. These kids tend to gain weight. And that brings along a whole host of other problems, diabetes, stroke risk, all, all of these things. So they're messing with their body with the cross-sex hormones in a way that makes them profoundly unhealthy. But it also does something else. The long, for example, the longer a female is on testosterone, the more discontented she is with her breasts. So it impels her to want to get a double mastectomy. The longer she's on testosterone, the more she's going to have pain in her, from her uterus and her vagina, and she's going to want to get rid of them because that's what medicine is offering. So again, it's like a train. It just drives you to the next station. And so once, once you are in the realm of surgery, which we know from studies that uh, teenage girls have gotten double mastectomies at the age of 13, 14, 15, you know, that's irreversible. You're never going to nurse. You're going to have complications from that. Genital surgeries on males as young as 15. And I won't go into the details of that except to say it's horrific. It's and horrible. the complications are huge, multiple surgeries. You know, so we're doing this on minors. Right. And I've seen some of the things that you've written, Mary, where you indicate that upwards of 93% of um, children or, you know, pre adolescents who experience this gender dysphoria by adulthood and sometimes even by very early adulthood. Um, have kind of come out of it. We're so quick to take, you know, your average tomboy or your average sensitive boy and immediately put them on hormones to make them worse. Yeah. I think it's important to understand the context of those studies because there were studies that were done for many years before this gender affirming protocol became the thing where everyone started pushing these hormones and puberty blockers on kids. Before that, the the treatment was psychotherapy for the family. Okay. You know, assuming there's something going on, or you leave the kid alone and you do what's called watchful waiting. And for the most part, these kids would, when you've got kids who are pre-puberty, for the most part, they would resolve those feelings 
typically by the time they're done with puberty. Why? Because that rush of hormones of their natural puberty helps to orient them right. and, and, and they, they work through it. Plus they're not getting that reinforcement that you're in the wrong body. You're yes, you're right. You're, you're really someone else. You got to escape your body. They're not getting that reinforcement, but it's not true to say that someone who at 14 or 15 starts experiencing, uh, maybe they're already suffering from depression or they've experienced sexual assault or they're on the autism spectrum. In in the UK, it was up to 30% were on the autism spectrum who, who were being treated in the gender clinic. But it, it's really important to know that there isn't good data because we haven't, in the past, we didn't see adolescents presenting with this. So, so the data is saying that most, most kids would resolve this was from an extremely small number of kids who started these confused feelings when they were prepubertal. We don't know what would otherwise happen to a 15-year-old who is experiencing this distress. They're, they're all being put on, on hormones. One of the things we do know is that when we listen to young people who've been in that situation, especially some of the detransitioners, they point out that, you know, they, and statistically, we know this is true, they had pre existing mental health issues. They had adverse childhood experiences. Many of them had sexual assault on the autism spectrum, you know, just a, a whole host of issues that are not addressed. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for an answer. The culture and, and now the medical community and psychological community is saying, you're uncomfortable, go on these hormones. But in the meantime, what that does is it prevents them from resolving those underlying issues. So, you know, if you're a kid who, a girl who was sexually assaulted and therefore you hate your body and you can't, you're repulsed by the idea of growing up to be a vulnerable woman, right? you never get a chance to deal with that. Instead, right. you're shepherded, you're put on the train towards a mastectomy and, and further surgeries. Right. And at the end of that train, when it arrives in the station and they've done all they can do for you, you're still carrying those wounds. Nothing's been resolved in terms of underlying issues. But Mary, let's talk a little bit about the social contagion aspect of all of this. Um, Abigail Schreier has a terrific book that came out um, oh, about a little over a year ago called Irreversible Damage, which actually got banned from Amazon, if I recall correctly, but I got it from Amazon before they banned it. And uh, in, in it, she talks about the social contagion of, um, of this trans craze, especially among girls, and compares it to anorexia back in the 70s and 80s. Um, in your Edify video, you, you talk about the fact that 10% of school children now identify as trans, or 10% 10, 10 of Americans, but that's an extraordinary number. Um, speak a little bit about this social factor, if you will, in this uh, growth in the trans industry and the trans population. People started realizing them as a social contagion factor when they started looking at the numbers and, and the change in demographics. So again, in the past, it was mostly adult men who experienced this trouble with their identity or very young children. And it was a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the population, 0.002% until about 15 years ago. And what happened 15 years ago was you had this ideological push that normalized this idea that you are who you say you are. You are who you feel you are. And at the same time, we had the explosion of social media. So 2015 is when we saw the numbers take off and almost every kid uh, had a smartphone and, and was accessing social media. And on social media, what we see are these young people who start to go down this path, who narrate their lives. It's like getting hooked on a soap opera, only it's someone's real life and it's, it's on social media. And so these They'd start narrating their journey, of course, curating it, just, just like in, in the soaps or the movies, right? You only put the best image forth. So, so they, they'd spin out these fantasies that other troubled young people, people who are hurting for some reason, right? We have much higher rates of mental health problems in our young people than we did, say, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, we have people talk about this generation as the loneliest generation in spite of being so connected because they don't they don't have the depth of relationships and 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 even the even the numbers every everything's sort of artificial and it's on the on social media so we started seeing reports from parents whose children had gotten caught up into this 
And a researcher named Lisa Lippman started doing some research and, and realized that there was a pattern here, that kids who were being drawn down this path, in other words, they're jumping on that trans train, typically that was preceded by what got them to the stop, right? The, the, the um, platform ready to jump on the, on the train was they were typically somewhat isolated. So many of them had, uh, had become really immersed in social media because that was their community. The social media communities were uh, very, very affirming and toxic in a sense, you know, telling them this is the way to be. And if your parents don't understand you, they're transphobic or whatever. <clears throat> but by and large, most of these young people already had pre existing mental health difficulties. To the extent that some of them were suicidal, that suicidal ideation was typical of someone who fit their profile, someone who already has depression, anxiety, autism, ADHD, eating disorders are very present in kids who are identifying as trans. So they have all these issues going on. Then they jump on, they find their community online or sometimes fueled by school. But a lot of, a lot of kids who identify as trans say, it wasn't until I saw this TikTok video that I knew who I was. I saw myself and I got words for it. And really what they're seeing is, oh, Okay, that that's a way to make sense of my life that promises me I can I can leave the pain behind. Right. And I can belong. Right. I'll belong. Um, this is my these are my people. This is my and and that's what I think so many right prepubescents and you know teenagers are looking for is inclusion and belonging and this community promises that in spades, right? And um but then once they're caught up in it, they find it very difficult to extricate themselves from it. And so getting to the medical piece, I'd like to circle back to uh, something you referenced a little bit earlier. And that was that whistleblower report from uh, Jamie Reed, who is a former employee of the Gender Transitioning Clinic at Washington University in Missouri, a very prestigious hospital network there, WashU, as they call it. And she herself, um, she says she's married to a trans man. Um, and they are raising both her biological children from a marriage that she had. She, she calls herself um, queer, and uh, that's her uh, adjective to describe herself and uses plural pronouns to reference herself as well. So not somebody who is a conservative, straight-laced person coming out of this clinic. But the things she reveals in this report that she wrote are absolutely shocking and um I, they should shock the conscience of anyone who is in the medical profession um, that, that claims to do no harm, right? That's the first part of the Hippocratic Oath. Can do you describe a little bit, you know, what, what you thought when you read her report and what impact do you think it's going to have? Yeah. It, first, it's had a devastating impact and you can tell because they are attacking her. Well, who's the they? So there's, there is a very strong community of trans activists on social media who anytime you have a transitioner or anyone who comes out as a truth teller, there is an immediate, it just attack. That's all you can say. And sometimes these things even get physical, but you know, she's, she's been attacked on social media for this, but, but here's the thing to know about her. So she went in with all the best intentions of the world. And, and yet she worked there during the course of her four years, she said what she found was parents and, and kids were being lied to. So that was the first thing they promised. Oh, multidisciplinary treatment, and and your listeners, Mary, should realize that that about 15 years ago there was one gender clinic for children in this country. And how many are there now? There's there's about a hundred because almost every children's hospital now has a, gen, a gender clinic because they're making money on this. So here she is, she starts working there. And what she discovered was they were lying to kids. This was not multidisciplinary care. It was a pipeline. It was not people doing careful assessments to see, gosh, this kid's got serious mental health issues, uh, depression, anxiety, really out of touch with reality. She gave some examples of kids who were identifying as quote, attack helicopters or, you know, or inanimate objects as well as being trans or something. In other words, these were deeply troubled children. And yet the doctor's response in every case was to put them on that trans train, get them started on the puberty blockers, or if they're old enough, get them started on the cross-sex hormone. So parents were being lied to that there was an assessment, that there was a careful looking at and trying to diagnose. 
Uh, but it, it highlights one of the flaws in diagnosing, quote, someone is trans because it all depends on their self-declaration. How do you diagnose someone? You ask them. So oh, are you trans? And they say, yes. So she talked about that. She talked about how they never tracked the outcomes. So she would see the letters come in from parents who were saying, my kid is, is more suicidal now that you put them on the cross-sex hormones. Or my kid is really struggling with, one kid had liver toxicity because of the combination of, of hormones and things. And yet none of that was measured, made public, or revealed to future you know, prospective patients, the parents and the, and the other kids who were coming in. So there was this climate of deception, concealment, just pushing kids on this, and then kids were getting injured. And that is probably the most devastating thing to read in her affidavit. She says things that we've heard in individual cases from many of the courageous detransitioners, people like Chloe Cole or, or Helena Kirshner, who went through these things and came out and told their stories, but yet they tend to be dismissed as, oh, that must be an aberration. Right. But when you he have someone like Jamie Reed saying, nope, I watched it in this prestigious center, those are not aberrations. We are injuring children. And this is unconscionable. And not just injuring them in terms of their bodies, depriving them of their fertility at a time when they can't, can't even make those decisions. So hers is a, a powerful voice. And the... Um, the attorney general of Missouri has opened an investigation. And interestingly, the hospital responded not by saying, oh, not true, you know, nothing to see here. They said, we're taking this very seriously. Why? Because her allegations are so credible and so documented. And, and the thing I would, I would stress is that what we know from people who have been treated at different uh, gender clinics, this is not an aberration. This is how it's done. This is how these gender clinics operate. And that's, it's a medical scandal. Well, you, you mentioned the financial remuneration, which must be significant. How do you think Big Pharma is promoting and benefiting from this? And, uh, and then by extension, uh, hospitals? Yeah. So Big Pharma was, or, or at least a pharmaceutical company over in Germany, was the original funder of what was called the Dutch Protocol. The Dutch were the ones who pioneered the idea of giving puberty blockers to children who were struggling with identity questions. They bought into the idea that somehow they could determine that a, a kid who's struggling with identity must be destined to grow up and be what they call a transgender adult, even though that was a fraction of a fraction and, and clear mental health problems and whatever. So they came up with the idea that, you know what, you can get better outcomes. Trans adults are often very miserable because they don't, quote, pass, because hmm. they're, a male has a male body. Right. And so the theory was, if we intervene early, if you have a child who's confused and you start transitioning them then, that little boy is never going to have the big broad shoulders and, and the, the masculine Adam's apple and the big hands. You can basically stunt his growth so he can pass as a female more easily. That was part of the rationale here. Wow. But the pharmaceutical company, Faring, over in Germany, underwrote those initial studies. Oh. And here, what we see is big pharma is involved in a, in a huge way. Uh, Gilead is, I believe, the first or second major funder of LGBTQ advocacy in the US. And, and they have special programs. We see transgender philanthropists who are providing the seed money for gender clinics hmm. in different cities. We saw Harvard Medical School receiving funds, again, from a foundation that was affiliated with someone who was part of the LGBT community, but also has these tie-ins to pharma, et cetera, you know, to fund medical school training. So this is, this is big business because it's not just when you transition a child, it's not just the money you make from implanting a puberty blocker or the money you make from giving them cross-sex hormones. Yeah, they're a repeat customer. But you're also triggering a cascade of other problems. So now you're going to have a kid who's, yeah, they're unhealthy. Now they're going to be a diabetic. Now they're going to be obese. Now they're going to have liver problems. They're going to, you're multiplying the possibilities 
for further treatment and further money. And the same thing with the surgeries. So when someone goes through a genital surgery, you know, nearly half of them have to go through a revision surgery just within a matter of months. And then there are continued complications down the road. So it's, it's not something magical, like you take a pill and all of a sudden you become uh, the opposite sex. It can't happen. You can't change sex. All they can do is change your appearance and destroy your natural function and then tether you to the medical system. And they'll keep giving you more, keep causing you more problems. So you, you won't break free. And that's one of the laments of some of these uh, just beautiful, but tragic young people who've gone through and then detransitioned and, and their bodies are a wreck and there's no one there to help them. Right. Because that's not where the profit lies. The profit lies not in getting them off the trans strain and trying to repair their body. The profit lies in keeping kids on there and, and multiplying their problems so that you've got more to fix. So it's, it's really horrible. Well, Mary, I can anticipate some of our listeners um, hearing this conversation and perhaps that they themselves have children who are starting to express um, nonspecific you know, gender preferences, um, or they see them sort of getting, going down a little bit of a road, like, you know, I don't want to wear a bra, mom, or, you know, mom, I'd like to wear pink if it's a boy, something like that. How, how do you um, help parents who are just starting to see this emerging in their children? What kind of resources would you recommend to them, either books or organizations that might be able to help them sort of nip it in the bud? If it's just something they're kind of exploring because it looks interesting and they're hearing about it at school, how do you stop it and reroute those children so they don't get on that train? Yeah. So I think you have to know your kid. Kids who already have a lot of other struggles, parents need okay. to be tuned in because this will become one of those problems okay. because it is offered as the easy solution that's going to solve their depression, solve their anxiety. So you need to be aware of that. Kids who who really are, are kind of normal kids, but maybe they're lonely, maybe they're struggling to fit in, maybe they're starting to go through puberty and they don't like their bodies. You have to be on the alert for what the signs are. You know, do they start changing their hair, their clothes, their what they're being called? Go on their social media. How are they presenting themselves on social media? And open up those conversations. Because if you say nothing, their questions and their insecurities are going to be answered by the strangers out there who have a, a game plan for them. They want to get them on that trans train. Right. So parents need to be attentive. They need to speak up. They need to ask. So, you know, I, I saw this. What do you think? What do your friends think? How does that make sense? Challenge kids to think and to, to sort things through. But then parents have got to be willing to take action. I know families who have many families who had kids get caught up in this. The ones who have successfully sort of freed their kids early on are the ones who, who looked very clearly and said, all right, where's the negative influence coming from? Is it a teacher, a counselor, a friend, a, a coach? We're going to, we're going to cut off those channels because you have to view this like the potential for serious drug addiction. If you know someone is best friends with someone who's a dealer, you, you got to cut off that friendship. Right. Because you've got to save your own kid before you, you can try to help that other kid. And sometimes it's simply pulling a kid out of a school and either homeschooling them or putting them in a different school. But in almost all cases, it's taking them, getting them off social media, taking the phone away, taking, you know, cutting those, those lines of just toxic influence. There's a great book called Desist, Detox and Detrans or Desist, Detrans and Detox by a woman named Maria Kevin which has a lot of self, self-help kinds of information for families whose kids are getting drawn into this. The website that I run, it's called personandidentity.com. If you go on there and click resources, we have a ton of resources. Oh, excellent. That's the place to start. And from there, you can find any, everything from support groups to therapists to just information and advice, get a sense of what's going on, understanding it from the perspective of Catholic teaching and medicine, good medicine. So uh, p parents need to educate themselves. You, you know, we love our kids, but boy, this is a, a treacherous culture out there. No, it's, it's so awful. And, you know, every child wants to fit in, especially when they're teenagers. And um, high school is difficult and middle school are difficult for everybody under the best of circumstances. But when you throw this into the mix, it's a it's a purgatory on earth. And um, my heart just breaks for parents who are watching their, 
sons or daughters going through this. But I mean, just switching gears um, to something less controversial, you are the founder of the Catholic Women's Forum at the EPPC. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the Catholic Women's Forum and what led you to start it in the first place? So the Catholic Women's Forum is a, a network of women professionals and scholars. Uh, we have women who are both based in, mostly based in the U.S., but also some abroad internationally. And uh, we, we developed the network out of a desire to provide fellowship for women who are trying to really serve the church with their gifts, particularly um, intellectual gifts, or who are serving the church in some other significant way, but also to, to create space to, to share ideas, to write, to collaborate on different projects in order to help the church. And so uh, there are some tremendous people, yourself included, you know, who are, who are part of this network, who are just doing tremendous things for the church. And, and I think Pope John Paul II uh, was one of the uh, great popes talking about the need for women to shape the moral dimension of culture. It's not to encourage women to go displace men, like, hey, where's our spot? It's rather saying, here we are, we have gifts, how can we serve? And um, creating openness and, and looking for those opportunities and particularly through collaboration. And, and we have, in fact, the work that I do with the Personal Identity Project was a, uh, you know, the fruit of that, because right. I work with several of Susan Selner Wright, Teresa Farnan, you know, on this project. And, and that developed out of women of strong faith coming together, sharing our um, academic or intellectual work, and then out of that, being open to the Holy Spirit, moving you to uh, to work together in some way to shape the culture. So there's a wonderful group of, of younger women, women, you know, younger than, than I am, and, you know, who are, who are coming up just so gifted, great hearts of faith. And it's beautiful to see the desire to serve, to, to be women, to be fully women, but to, to put our gifts at the disposal of, of the Lord in whatever way he calls. Well, it's a, Mary, it's a tremendous initiative and I, it's just been a great gift to the church and, um, and to everyone involved in it. So thank you. All right, so now we're going to do one a one question lightning round. Okay, you ready for your question? All righty. Ready? What is a woman? An adult human female. A woman is a daughter of the Lord. Actually, that's the Catholic answer. A daughter of the King. There you go. There are some things you just can't deny, and male and female, He created them. We are equal but different, and that's something to be celebrated. Well, Mary Rice Hassan, thanks so much for being with us today. It's always, I could talk to you all morning, but um, I won't keep you much longer, but thank you. It's always a joy to, to speak with you and to tap into your vast amount of knowledge. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the chance to speak with you. Thank you for listening. To make it easier for you to listen to future Edify podcast episodes, please make sure you subscribe over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you.